Jeffrey Goldberg had this uh, popular article about Pakistan a few years back, it called it the ally from hell, and I shamelessly stole it, that because this case really is the worst of all scenarios, basically across the board. Uh, U.S. concerns when Pakistan started pursuing nuclear weapons, the main one was, you know, India had done this peaceful nuclear test in 1974, but it hadn't actually built an arsenal in there. Like, if Pakistan gets nuclear weapons, there's no way India is not going to weaponize this capability, and that could strain the uh, crisis between the two countries. And then also, early, even from an early time, they worried that Pakistan was going to sell its nuclear technology to other countries, which could be a huge problem for the U.S. And they were about, right on both counts, basically. So I'm not going to go through all these again. Um, but I do want to focus on nuclear proliferation undermines geopolitics. What I mean by this is the fact that Pakistan was first pursuing and acquired nuclear weapons really made it more difficult for the U.S. to achieve its objectives in, the, in South Asia. During the 1980s, the U.S. wanted to fight this proxy war with the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. And to do so, the Reagan administration really had to walk a careful balancing act to ensure Congress would continue giving aid to uh, Pakistan, which it wouldn't do if they said Pakistan had nuclear weapons, even though, you know, by the middle of the decade or so, basically, for all intents and purposes, did. So that's, again, some alternative facts. Um, more importantly, um, after 9-11, I've talked to a lot of some U.S. policymakers who were involved in this area, in the Obama and Bush administration. You know, the U.S. wants to pursue this global war on terror, and I think, to some extent, the U America's ability to prosecute this war, go after these terrorists, was inhibited by the fact that Pakistan had nuclear weapons, because every policy had to be seen through the lens of, that will destabilize Pakistan, we can't have Pakistan, the government uh, falling, and the, to create loose nukes, and we don't want terrorists to get nuclear weapons, so it did in some level constrain what we could do in prosecuting the war on terror, because we always had to think, how does this impact Pakistan and its nuclear weapons? I want to also highlight US, increased U.S. engagement. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, pessimists, or the, pes or the optimists say, if these countries, if our friends get nuclear weapons, we can reduce our engagement there. And at least in this case especially, that is not the case at all. You know, India and Pakistan fought three wars before they got nuclear weapons, and it wasn't the U.S. didn't care about them at all, but it was, you know, a very low-level secondary issue, pretty much. But once the Indo-Pakistani dispute goes nuclear, every time there's even a crisis, it becomes a major uh, concern for U.S. policymakers because of its potential to escalate to the nuclear level. So the first crisis in the nuclear era was uh, 1990 and 1991, and this is the first time the U.S. actually sends an the president sends an envoy to, to talk both sides back from the brink. It was Robert Gates in that case. And actually, the uh, deputy director of the CIA at the time is Dick Kerr during this 1990-1991 crisis, and he said about it, um, let me actually just give you that quote. He said, uh, quote, it was far more frightening than the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he was actually in government for the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this is actually kind of a smaller dispute in the grand scheme of India-Pakistan disputes. So that is a huge cost, I think. Um, the loose nukes issue is pretty well understood, I think. And then the nuclear supply proliferation, nuclear proliferation chain again, like France, Pakistan sold nuclear technology or tried to, in the case of Iraq, um, to country to other countries, help them build nuclear weapons. And in this case, we're not talking about a country like Israel that has friendly relations with the U.S. We're talking about a who's who of countries that are America's adversaries. I'm not going to focus this on too much because I think most people know about that whole thing. So lessons for Saudi Arabia, the Luke's nu nukes issue, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but Saudi Arabia is not like the poster child of a modern 21st century country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if, you know, Saudi Arabia gets these bombs and then uh, falls apart at some point, which seems like at least a possibility, I think that, you know, that would be a huge issue. And, well, it's not the haven for terrorists that Pakistan is. You know, there's the potential for Saudi generals or scientists to sympathize with fundamentalist groups and perhaps give them nuclear weapons or fiscal material. <coughs> nuclear proliferation undermines geopolitics. Um, again, make people probably notice that over the last 20 years or so, the U.S. hasn't been very good at achieving its objectives in the Middle East. But uh, <laughs> does that, if Saudi Arabia and Iran get nuclear weapons, does that become easier or harder to do? I think harder, and we're starting from a low base already. And then the big one, I think, is you know, the Iran-Saudi Arabia proxy war. Obviously, we're already very concerned about these proxy wars in Syria and Yemen. What about if you add the nuclear dimension to it? Is it you know it's going to become a way bigger concern? You know, if we start bombing Iran, Saudi Arabia bombed Iranian advisors in Yemen, does that escalate to nuclear war? You know, so just like with the India-Pakistan case, I think that would make um, it a lot more important. U.S. policymakers have to devote a lot more resources and time to dealing with than we do today. Um, that I think is the end.